Hello, AP Bio. Welcome to our video lecture for Chapter 18, Genomes and Their Evolution. For this chapter, I've picked a picture of some chimpanzees. Um, I love this picture. It looks like that fellow's reaching out to shake your hand, right? So this chapter is a, a kind of a fun chapter. Um, there isn't a whole lot of, of detailed stuff to memorize, but there are some concepts in this chapter that are just very, very fascinating. Um, and one of them is the idea that you and a chimp are about 99 or so percent the exact same DNA. So what is it about genomes that um, can, you know, make you, you, a homo sapiens and a chimp, you know, very, very different in phenotype, but still about 99% the exact same DNA. Um, and we're going to end with a couple words on evolution. We haven't done evolution in class yet, but we're sort of, you know, we're, we're going to get there in chapter 19. So just an overview. So due to how quickly we can sequence DNA, we have complete genome sequences for numerous species from a chimp to you to E. coli to a to a, a to corn to a fruit fly and we can use computers to compare genomes to see what similarities and what differences they have what you really need to do this is super fast dna sequencing which we have and very very powerful supercomputers that can compare sequences quickly um, so genomics so you know the study of of comparing genes is, is genomics the second word bioinformatics this is an important word so I'm not sure we've done this lab in class, John. If we've done the, the BLAST lab, um, where we use the BLAST tool to, to search a DNA sequence, this will sound familiar. If we haven't, we're going to do it. So bioinformatics is the idea where you use a computer and you put DNA or protein sequences into the computer and it searches a massive database to see what kind of matches that, that come up. Um, in the late um, 20th century, so the 90s and I guess early 21st century, uh, the Human Genome Project was a, a worldwide aim to basically sequence the three billion DNA base pairs for humans. It took over a decade to do it, and the way that you, you did it, and this isn't important that you know this, but basically you would take a chromosome and break it into pieces and, and sequence the pieces and then find overlaps using a computer, and the overlaps, you know, like, like pair them up like a big puzzle. Um, to get the entire chromosome. You don't sequence the entire chromosome at once. You sequence pieces of it and then put them together like, like a puzzle. Um, again, it took over a decade to do this. Now you can sequence a genome in a couple of days, if not faster. The word metagenomics, this is just the idea. So say that I want to study all the types of bacteria and the uh, hot springs of Old Faithful, you know, identifying all the bacteria with a microscope. I don't, I don't want to do that. Um, this is the idea that you take a sample from the environment and you sequence all the DNA in that sample and use that to identify what species are there and what, what's interacting. Obviously, this only works if you can sequence DNA fast and you have a big database to compare DNA sequences to. Um, I keep mentioning these databases. So there's a bunch throughout the world. The NCBI, the National Center for Biotechnology, um, information is one that we use in the um, United States. Europe has one, Japan has one, China has one. These are databases where you can, and only, it's almost like a big Google search, but it's of DNA sequences, sequences. Not only can you search for a specific sequence, but you can also upload new data to it. GenBank, which is the NCBI sequence, when this slide was written, which is, this is, this is outdated as of now, but every 18 months, it doubled the number of sequences in its database. So say that I'm a scientist working with a certain kind of gene, I can type in the A's, T's, G's, and C's of that gene, insert it, and it will tell me where, where that matches in humans and frogs and mice and, and, and numerous different organisms. This is a very powerful tool, obviously. This just shows, excuse me, so here they put in a, a query, a sequence, now, this obviously is not a DNA sequence because look at the letters. Um, this is a, a protein sequence. Each letter represents an amino acid. So you can do this with proteins. And I put in this sequence, and it gives me all the matches. There's a match in cows, a match in mustard plants, and corn, and humans, and nematodes, and yeast. And it highlights the, the sections of the gene that are the same. Um, and this is giving a, a, a 3D picture of the protein. And this highlighted area is the area of overlap. So like these, this protein 
is found in way different organisms and the protein might do different things in different organisms, but it has this domain right here that's the same. So that kind of gives you some evolutionary hints as to where this protein came from. And notice the sequences are pretty far apart where they overlap, but because proteins can fold back on themselves, um, this shouldn't be that surprising. Systems biology is the idea, um, let me just give you an example. So the idea of studying cancer like as one big you know, system of disease, just many, many different types of cancers and ways that a uh, cell can become cancerous, but trying to identify the most common mutations that lead to cancer. Um, proteomics is the same thing, but instead of using DNA, you use proteins. You use the amino acid sequence instead of um, the DNA sequence. And you can use these silicon and glass chips. This is what, what one looks like that, um, we discussed this in, in a previous chapter where you can see what, what genes are present in, in a whole system by using a, a computer chip like this. Um, you don't really need to know much about that. So this is a fascinating slide. Um, the data on this slide, this is nothing you need to memorize. And actually, if you look at the date, this slide's almost, almost 10 years old in terms of the, the data on it. But it just gives you some, some ideas as to the size and complexity of, of genomes. Um, I, I wanna actually use this slide to sort of analyze, because the AP exam, none of this should you memorize, of course, but they could give you data to analyze. So let's just go through this together quickly. So I have domain bacteria, domain archaea, and domain eukarya. We haven't done the domains yet, really. Um, both of these are what, you know, back in the day you would call bacteria. Eukarya is plants, algae, animals, and protists. So you're in eukarya. So genome size, so the NB is megabases, which is millions of bases. So, you know, obviously eukaryotes have between 10 and 40,000 million bases, much larger genomes than bacteria. Number of genes, how many genes does it take to make a bacteria? So 1,500 to close to 8,000. For eukaryotic cells, obviously it's much higher. Gene density, though, is the number of genes inside the genome. So it's like a, a unit of, well, it's a unit of density. And notice that bacteria have a higher gene density than eukaryotes. Bacteria have fewer genes, right? But the density is higher because they have fewer bases. Lots of the DNA in eukaryotes is, it's not, when I was in school, we called it junk DNA. It's really not junk. There's a reason for it, but it's DNA that doesn't actually code for proteins. Um, and we discussed introns and exons. Bacteria don't have introns. Sometimes of, some types of archaea do have introns. Um, your cells, eukaryotic cells, have introns that you have to cut out. Uh, again, other regions of non-coding DNA, DNA that doesn't code for proteins or messenger RNAs, um, very, very little. In bacteria, you have lots of non-coding DNA. You know, we use the term junk DNA. The term non-coding DNA is a much better term. Um, so let's just let's just look at this. So, and actually, you know what? I'm not actually presenting this presentation. Let's do it like we normally do it, make it bigger. There we go, that's how it usually looks. Okay, so let's just look. So how many genes does it take to make a human? So here's human, Homo sapiens. Um, just under 21,000 genes to make a human, that's all you need. Um, compare that to like rice, over 40,000. Compare that to corn, 32,000. Um, it takes more genes to make corn than it does to make a human. Um, what else is surprising? The mustard family, mustard plants, have more genes than humans do. Um, bacteria, again, look at the numbers, just over 1,000 to, you know, four or 5,000. Um, that's, to me, that's surprising. It only takes 21,000 genes, more or less, to make a human. Um, so in terms of numbers of genes, you can, you can read this yourself. Um, the main thing I want you to know from this slide is this last point, which we've already discussed. You know, 21,000 genes isn't a lot of genes to make a human, but you do um, alternative DNA splicing or actually RNA splicing of messenger RNAs, you can splice genes different ways. So one gene in humans could actually become multiple different types of messenger RNAs based upon alternative splicing, which bacteria don't do. So you can kind of get away with only having 21,000 genes because you can splice them different ways. Okay, so this slide starts us into a slightly, slightly different topic. So, you know, chapter 19, we're gonna start evolution. So 
you know, the ultimate source of new genes is mutation. You know, I, I understand theoretically how you go from normal hemoglobin to sickle cell. This is a, a point mutation of a single base changing one amino acid like that, I get. I get how mutations can create new genes. But what I don't fully get or what's much harder to understand conceptually is like, how, how do you evolve hemoglobin in the first place? Like, where did those 21,000 genes come from? Like, I get that DNA can mutate, but like, how is it that I can create such complex organisms based upon a process that's largely random in mutations? And biology can't fully answer that question, to be honest. I don't have a, a, an answer for you. But there are some things that happen in cells that help you to understand how you can like, evolve different types of hemoglobin. Um, pseudogenes are, are copies of genes in your DNA that don't work anymore. So like you have a gene for hemoglobin. Elsewhere in your genome, there are copies of the gene for hemoglobin that are mutated and don't work anymore. Like what? Like what the, where did those come from? What the heck is that? Repetitive DNA is just DNA that repeats. It has multiple copies of, of the same DNA. And the way that, that you get things like pseudogenes is very interesting. And it, it doesn't seem to directly relate to evolution, but it actually does if, if you think about it. You know, for example, actually we'll go to some examples in a minute, but you, you have genes in your body that do that make very different proteins. But the sequence of those genes is very, very, very similar. Like maybe they originated from one gene that got duplicated and those two versions evolved different ways to today to give you way different proteins. But because their sequences are so similar, it's like, well, that can't just be a coincidence, right? This chart just shows only 1.5% of your DNA as exons is actually coding. The rest are regulatory sequences like promoters, introns that get cut out, unique non-coding, repetitive DNA, transposons, things that we're, we're going to see in a minute. Um, you don't need to have these numbers memorized. This just shows you that most of your DNA doesn't actually code for proteins. Okay, so this leads us to a story, all right? And again, this, this story might not seem, it might not be obvious how it relates to evolution, but it totally does. So Barbara McClintock was a scientist, a geneticist. Um, she's American. She's uh, working somewhere in New England. I, I forget what state. And this is the middle of the 20th century. And she proposes these things called transposons or transposable elements. And this, this is going to sound crazy at first. And when she first proposed this, people did not accept it like at all. This was not like people thought this idea was pretty silly until she could prove it. Um, some people nicknamed this idea jumping genes. Okay, and the, the term jumping genes actually kind of gives it away. So she said that segments of DNA can actually move from one chromosome or one site in your genome to another. So a gene can actually like get up and move to a different place. Again, this seems far-fetched, but you know what? She was right. She, her, her organism of, of choice was um, Indian corn, like maize. Um, you can see the different, I, I, I'm not quite sure how she can relate the different patterns, patterns of color in the corn to the genes, but she's a geneticist. She figured it out, and she ended up being absolutely right. Um, she discovered what, what, you know, textbooks or what she called transposons or transposable elements. So look at the diagram. So here I have a transposon. This is just a gene. Um, and the gene actually like gets copied and then the copy moves to a new place in the genome. So this is an idea where sometimes, at least in this picture, you, you leave a copy of the gene behind and then move a copy to a new place. So basically you have two copies of that gene. Now this could potentially be bad, like maybe you don't want two copies of the gene. Um, but on one hand, this could be good because say one of the copies gets a random mutation and becomes non-functional. Well, you have no, another backup copy that, that actually works. All right. Retro transposons um, still leave a, a copy behind, but they have a, an extra step where they, they take the RNA, use reverse transcriptase, which we've discussed in previous chapters, to make it the DNA and then move the copy um, to a new place, it's just sort of like, like an, an extra step. Um, I don't want to do that just yet. So like, you know, 
nature does this, right? Why in the heck would nature move genes around in the genome? And why is it significant that sometimes they leave a copy behind? Well, in a minute, we're going to go through the globin family, the different types of hemoglobins. And, you know, long story short, you had different versions of hemoglobin, um, like fetal hemoglobins when you're um, a baby or when you're, uh, when you're growing in the womb, and adult hemoglobin is what you have now. Where did that come from? How do you have different versions of hemoglobin? Well, maybe at one point there was one version that jumped around and made different copies of itself, and those different versions mutated different ways. Could have been bad, could have been fatal to the cell, but if it was a mutation that was novel and that was good, you just evolved, right? You just created, well, let's not get ahead of ourselves. You just created a, a new trait that might be beneficial. And the original version is still there. Okay. So I said a minute ago, like, I don't, I, it's a hard time wrapping your head around how you get hemoglobin. Like I get how sickle cell mutates, but how do you get new genes like this? Well, this is sort of like a hint how genes can make copies of themselves and move around and play with each copy and see if you can get um, genes that, are, that make the organism fitter. Um, the, the idea of short tandem repeats, STRs, you should sort of know what this is. So throughout your genome, this has what about 14%, you have what are called short tandem repeats, which are just like sequences of two to five nucleotides, like GGA, 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 and they might repeat dozens or hundreds of times. Um, we use those in DNA fingerprinting, like in crime scenes or fraternity tests or, or whatever, because the number of times that sequence repeats is unique to each individual, unless you're an identical twin, right? So I can use these short tandem repeats to identify a sample you know, it's DNA fingerprinting. It's it's who committed the crime. Um, that's how I get your genetic profile. Like I, I, like, I don't sequence DNA to see what color eyes do you have. Although you can do that. I sequence DNA in terms of crime scenes to look at these repeats to see if it matches the sample from the, um, from the crime scene. Okay, hemoglobin. This gets to the good stuff. So multi-gene families. So, um, you know, in hemoglobin, there's four subunits. We've already said this. Um, there's two alpha units and two beta units. You have alpha globins and beta globins, and they're different polypeptides that make hemoglobin. Do I have this bigger? Yeah, I do. Um, and so a multi-gene family is like hemoglobin, where you have a bunch of different genes that do similar things, right? So it's like a family of genes. So just look at this diagram for a second. So let me first talk about what, what is fetal hemoglobin. So when, when you're an embryo, you know, you have blood, your heart's pumping, there's blood going through um, the embryo, but the blood is not going to the lungs until you're born, right? The blood's going to the placenta to get oxygen from the mother. Fetal hemoglobin binds oxygen stronger than adult hemoglobin. So in the placenta, you know, the, the blood supplies don't actually mix. If they mixed and the mom and the baby were different blood types, which they oftentimes are, that would be bad, right? Um, but what happens is the, the blood capillaries in the, in the placenta, the blood doesn't mix, but things can go back and forth between them, like oxygen, carbon dioxide, waste products, food, whatever. Um, and because fetal hemoglobin binds oxygen stronger, an adult hemoglobin, basically the baby steals oxygen from its mother's hemoglobin. Um, those babies, man, they're, they're really, really selfish, let me tell you. Um, just wait till they're born. But anyway, so like, but that's, that's like by design because the baby isn't breathing. The mom is breathing in new oxygen, the baby's not. Now, once you're born and once you grow up, you don't need fetal hemoglobin anymore because you're an adult. Um, you have the adult versions of, of hemoglobin. Do you still have the genes for that? Yes, of course you do. You still have all your genes, but they aren't expressed. So the question is, how in the world do I have more than one type of hemoglobin? Like, like how, where'd that come from? Well, think about the idea of transposons, right? Maybe at some point there was one version of hemoglobin that transposoned itself in different places. You had different mutations, some of which could have been good, some of which could have been bad. And that leads us to the system that we have today. It's messy, it's very complicated. Um, they're on different chromosomes, 16 and 11. There's the, you know, you can look at the, the Greek letters. There's different types of the hemoglobin genes. 
some of which might actually be non-functional, um, not so much in this picture, but you could have copies of the genes elsewhere that don't work anymore. They are, you know, it's, it's trash, but in doing the transposon process, you might get genes that are trash, but you also might get things that end up being better, all right? So like, you know, if you ask me the question, how did hemoglobin evolve? I, I, I can't answer that question definitively, but this transposons gives us a clue as to how it could have evolved, which is very, very interesting. Um, this slide, you know, it says what kind of what I, what I just said. So you can imagine the first forms of life having a minimal number of genes, they got by fine. And over time, genome size has gotten bigger because of mutations and transposons and whatever. Um, and as you accumulate these mutations, some of them might be beneficial to allow the organism to, to survive and reproduce better. This takes us to chapter 19, which is when we start evolution. So the, this chapter ends with just some interesting facts. Um, you know, all, all this kind of shows how genetic changes can lead to evolution. So humans and chimps, right? Chimps are your closest ancestor. Or, I'm sorry, are your closest relative on Earth. They're your cousins. Um, chimps and modern chimps and humans have a common ancestor. So you have 23 pairs of chromosomes. Chimps have 24. All right, interesting fact. Well, if you look at your second longest chromosome, human chromosome two, and the chimpanzee chromosomes 12 and 13, it looks like somewhere back in the line before humans and chimps diverged, that ancestor had this thing going on. And their chromosome 12 and 13 actually fused, which can have the chromosomes confused. Usually that's bad, um, into what has become our chromosome number two. And what's interesting is, remember the word telomere? Telomeres were the ends of the chromosomes. Um, the middle of your chromosome number two has telomere like sequences. Like, what? Like, why? Why? Like, there's got to be a reason for that. Well, maybe it's because your chromosome two is a product of chromosome 12 and 13 fusing in, a, in an ancestor. Um, you also have, it's sort of like your, your centromeres, you know, those are the places where the chromosomes attach, right? That like, it, there's sort of two different places where there are centromere sequences, which, you know, if you look at the chimp chromosome, you can kind of see how if these two fuse, you would, get, you would get that. So does this prove that humans and chimps have a common ancestor? By itself, no, but you know, you, you don't get this by accident. There's a reason why your chromosome two looks like this, all right? So it's a very interesting clue. Um, if you compare humans to mice, I forget how many chromosomes a mouse has, but mouse chromosomes seven, eight, 16, and 17. And again, we number chromosomes by their length. The longest chromosome is one, then two, then three. So it's just, it's just by how long they are. Um, you know, look at the genes on these four chromosomes and look at your chromosome 16. Like, it seems like your chromosome 16 in a way early ancestor, you know, before humans diverged from mice, which would be way before humans and chimps diverged, that those blocks of genes got collected on one chromosome, whereas what the branch that became mice kept it separate, all right? Again, doesn't prove anything, but it's, again, you know, evolution would explain why it is the way that it is, right? Um, when Darwin first proposed evolution, he wasn't trying to be provocative or he, he wasn't trying to create some crazy idea. He was trying to create a theory that explained his observations, right? And, the, and largely in the Galapagos, um, although it wasn't just the Galapagos. Um, evolution explains this and evolution explains this, all right? This is a good little note on science. Science seeks to create theories to explain observations, right? If you have a better explanation for a series of observations, please propose it. Um, but a theory, a good theory, is the best explanation of observations that we have now. Um, again, we discussed transposons, how transposons can create copies of genes. You could have unequal crossing over that could do this. Um, you could have you know, genes duplicate, those are mutations. Um, all these things collectively can give you multiple copies of the same gene. Um, the human globin genes, we, um, we talked about how you get dates, like how, how we think these diverged 450 to 500 million years ago, that's gonna be a later chapter. 
but it seems like there was one ancestral globin gene that evolved into the alpha and the beta versions, maybe due to a transposon. Then you got the alpha family. Then you got the beta family that, that diverged from the alpha and the beta you know, ancestors of, of the gene. All right, there's ways of measuring mutation rates while we think this number is what it is. This is a later chapter. Um, this just shows like a, a blast search looking at amino acid sequences between different, this is the alpha, um, the alpha globin like this one, and I forget what Greek letter that is. But basically the more, you know, the yellows are what's highlighted. The more that are highlighted, the more you have in common, the closer you're related. So the more differences you have, the further back you diverge. These are all concepts we're gonna to get to later. This chart we're gonna talk about later. Um, this is an example that I wanna go through quickly. So um, lysozyme is a, 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 a molecule that's found in things like tears. Lysozyme helps to break down um, bacteria and such. Alpha lactobumin, I forget the function of alpha lactobumin. Oh, here it is. Alpha lactobumin is a non enzymatic protein that plays a role in milk production. So, lysozyme helps break down bacteria. Alpha lactobumin helps with milk production. They totally do way different things, but their structures are so similar that it seems, I mean, why would their structures be similar? All right. I guess there could be many reasons for that, but maybe it's because they once were one gene like one ancestor gene that did a transposon thing that formed two copies of that gene. And one of them is the ancestor of today's lysozyme, and one is the ancestor of today's alpha lactobumin. But the fact that those two genes, which do way different things, but are very similar structurally, there has to be a reason for that. And evolution explains why that is. We've already discussed how transposable elements can contribute to, to evolution. Um, you know, they, they could be bad. If you insert a gene into another gene, that obviously would be bad, but maybe the, the, the copy of the transposon becomes something that's beneficial for fecal organism. Um, so the end of this chapter, you know, we're gonna get, get into evolution later. I'm gonna skip that slide right there. So this shows a thing called a cladogram. So actually, you know what? L let me go back a second. So, if you want to compare species and you want to know how distantly they separated from one another or how far back their common ancestor is, like you and a chimp, your common ancestor is much more recent than you and a mouse. So what you want to do is create these things called cladograms. So notice the one on the top. For both these, the x-axis is time. Here we are in billions of years ago. Here we are in, I mean, that bar to go away, millions of years ago. So this is showing, you know, Bacteria and archaea and eukarya diverged, you know, in this case, three, actually, let me say that again. Bacteria diverged from eukarya and archaea 3.7 billion years ago. When did eukarya and archaea diverge? Three billion years ago, these are called nodes. Now, look at this one. Here I'm taking this little part and, and zooming in on it. When did chimps and humans diverge? This shows about five million years ago. When did humans and mice diverge? Well, you have to go back to the most recent common ancestor for a human and a mouse, which goes back here, which would be about 65 million years ago, all right? How you create these charts, they're called cladograms. This is chapter 20, which we'll talk about actually pretty soon. Um, but the, the concept I want you to get it now is that if you wanna compare species that are distantly related, like you and a bacteria, you have to use genes that are highly conserved. And that means they're genes that haven't changed much over time. Let me give you an example. Um, glycolysis, going back to chapter seven. Glycolysis is a process that pretty much all life does. So find an enzyme in glycolysis that you have and that bacteria have, all right? It's probably pretty similar because this, this is a similar process. Those proteins would be coded for genes that are highly conserved because they haven't changed much, right? So highly conserved genes are good for comparing things that diverged a long, long, long time ago. Now, say you want to compare species that diverged more recently, right, like humans and chimps, you might want to compare um, genes that aren't as highly conserved. Being, you know, if I want to use, I might use hemoglobin 
that gene to compare you and a chimp because those, you know, bacteria don't have hemoglobin. So that's more of a, a more recent protein on planet Earth. So those would be genes that are not highly conserved, which means they're more recent. Okay, hopefully that, that makes sense. And I began the chapter by saying humans and chimps differ 1.2% as single base pairs, 2.7% because if you add in insertions and, and deletions, that's not a, a, a huge difference. Um, the last thing I want to mention is just these, these two terms, SNPs and CNVs. Single nucleotide polymorphisms is a, a mutation in just a single nucleotide. Copy variant or copy number variants are changes in the number of repeats. So kind of like, kind of like the STRs earlier, if, if that sequence repeats 10 times versus 20 times, that's a CNV. A mutation in the sequence would be an SNP. Um, and I want to end you, and where this number comes from, we'll see later, that as a species, humans have only been around for about 200,000 years. That's, that's like yesterday in terms of how old the Earth is, which is about 4.6 billion years. Um, we'll discuss this in a later chapter, obviously. And within humans, there's low species variation. So like within the human species, you compared to someone else are practically identical DNA, with the exception of, you know, 1.5% were things that code for proteins, right? Those could be different. And then your short tandem repeats um, can be different. All right. Okay. That was a lot for one chapter. Hope that was helpful. I will see you guys next time.